So we're going to get started. So our first presentation and speaker is Len Becker on documenting silence place naming practices in the Sierras of Northern New Mexico. All right. So um, like uh, Len Becker is a marketing that's my talk. Place names in um, it's most often called the um, Sangre de Cristo Mountains, although that name did not exist for that range until the 20th century. Uh, that was first published in tourist brochures uh, in the early 20th century. It used to be a name only of the mountain range in Colorado, starting from Sierra Blanca going north. Um, here's a picture of um, one set of mountains up there. Um, it is on on. Oh well. Um, so these are some of the names that were documented in the early nineteenth that early twentieth century. This is Harrington nineteen twenty. Uh, Tewa names for those mountains. So the, the ones in the back are called Hussein Ping, which means rock horn mountain, and you can see the um, decomposition into the uh, morphine. And then this one in the front is called Agacha and Ping, which is the uh, eastern sacred mountain of the Tewa people. Um, this is the Spanish place names for this area. Um, the whole range in the back is called the Sierra de las Truchas. Um, people differentiate different peaks. Um, to my knowledge, only in Truchas itself. People other places just have the general name, Sierra de las Truchas. In Truchas, they call it Picacho del Medio, Picacho del Sur. Uh, below the Picacho del Sur, there's a lake called the Laguna de Jose Vigil. It was a 19th century um, or 18th century person that lived in uh, Cundillo. Um, this one in the back, it's called La S. <laughs> is a new name on the southern aspect of this mountain. There's um, a meadow in the shape of an S. And at some time in the 1950s, 1960s, 1970s perhaps, this place got that new name, La S. Um, and then at the front, which is where I'm taking the picture from, is, is from the ridge up um, Cerro de la Laguna. Um, which is by the Santa Fe ski area. Uh, and this is in February, and as you can see, there's um, no snow. But these are the names that are mapped. You've got Middle Truchas Peak, Truchas Peak, Jose Vigil Lake, and Lake Peak. So, what's happened there? So, cartography right, is a professional enterprise has discourses related to it. These discourses tend to be positivistic, right? Cartography is a science. Mm -hmm. Maps are a representation, an accurate representation of the surface of the earth. And that's all that it, that it is, right? However, this is a person, J.B. Harley, was a historian of cartography, and he said, our job is to search for the social forces that have structured cartography and to locate, locate the presence of power and its effects in all map knowledge. Um, this is a concept that he brings into that, the concept of toponymic silence, where he says, conquering states impose a silence on minority or subject populations through their manipulation of place names. Whole strata of ethnic identity are swept from the map in what amounts to acts of cultural genocide. While such manipulations are at one level the result of deliberate censorship and policies of culturation, at another level they can also be seen as representing unconscious rejection of these other people by those belonging to politically more powerful groups. He's actually talking about medieval Europe in this essay, but it's very much applicable here. So who's in charge of that? Who does that here in the US for New Mexico? That would be the Board on Geographic Names, which is a board created in uh, 1890 in charge of standardizing toponymy uh, for use on government publications federal government publications, which include the U.S. Geological Survey and Forest Service maps. Um, and this is actually from a brochure of theirs, where they admit that whole thing. 
Um, the origins of the Bordeaux geographic names can be traced to the surge of exploration, settlement, and economic exploitation of the American West after the Civil War. Contradictions and inconsistencies concerning names of geographic features were a serious problem. Right? What's the source of these contradictions? Oh, there's all these people here. They all have different traditions. They all have different oral traditions of what these places are called. We can't have all of it. It's too confusing. Right? And so we get this, right? Erasure of the layer of Spanish naming, erasure of the layer of indigenous naming, which these are Tewa names. This particular mountain in the back, Tierra de las Truchas, has names in Tewa, Tiwa, Towa, Quedes, Navajo, and at least also, um, what's the Apache group at Dulce? Jicarilla? Uh, Jicarilla. So at least six indigenous, uh, probably seven, Comanche, seven indigenous groups had names for this feature historically. Some of them may retain those names, some of them may have forgotten. Um, and so, you know, the point is not just to point at it, but to contest this um, silence, right? So how, um, what, what am I doing to do that? So um, I'm going to show you today is four things. I'm going to show how I documented historical and contemporary Nuevo Mexicano in Manito, or Manito, place names. Um, I'm going to show a typology of linguistic strategies that um, are in evidence on the maps that are published. I'm going to quantify the accuracy with which these maps represent Manito oral tradition. And I'm going to um, show uh, some of the maps that I've been creating um, to sort of right the wrongs, I guess, or something. Um, so this is the area of study. Um, Santa Fe, Las Vegas, and Budo, Mora, those are kind of cardinal points. You can argue, and I still. And this um, is called the Sierra, uh, Sierra de Santa Fe. Um, the, um, of course, this was settled by Spanish settlers before the 1700. That area, going towards Trampas, Truchas, um, it settled after 1700, and all of this only gets settled after 1790 um, when the um, wars with the Comanche are over. Um, I'm not entirely sure when Tres Ritos was founded. I haven't been able to find that information, but somewhere between 1700 and 1800 is my guess. Um, and so Manitos coming into this area um, were what is known as a culture of habitat. So culture of habitat is a um, culture whose main mode of production is living off the land without um, over, um, over extracting resources. Right? So sustainable um, indigenous lifestyle, basically, um, which consisted of small scale agriculture, um, pastoralism, hunting, uh, natural resource procurement, leña, uh, mushrooms, whatever, um, and barter trade, right? Um, this is actually a picture of northern Spain, a bunch of sheep, right? Which, uh, to illustrate the point of what's known in, in geography as pre-adaptation, which is when a, a group moves to a new area and their life ways are already adapted to surviving in this new area. And pastoralism was very much applicable here in these mountains. Um, these are um, the people that I worked with. Um, they were from Las Trampas, Truchas, Terero, El Macho, Pecos, La Otra Banda, La Doom, or um, the, by the old name San Jose de la Cebolla, and Cañoncito, and my uh, consultant from Cañoncito, Rosa Gallegos, is here today. Uh, and we'll see some of her contributions as well. Um, and yesterday, I did an interview with somebody from Mona. So this is ongoing research. Um, methodology, right? Um, so this is a website. It's called caltopo, C-A-L-topo.com. And you're able to sort of manipulate what kinds of maps you're showing. So this is the US Forest Service map of those mountains that I was showing you earlier. Um, 
from 2016. So this is really recent. These are, you know, in terms of like topographic detail, very good maps. Um, and so I show my uh, my consultants these maps, and I say, is this the name that you know this place by? And I can show them um, satellite images, aerial photography, um, different ways of representing that same area to get them to visualize it uh, and to know, you know, because a lot of these people don't have experience working with this type of map, right? They don't have experience reading those. They don't have the literacy to do that particular thing. Um, and so this, is uh, a bit of my results, and I don't think any of that is read readable, but that's Pikachu del Sur, Pikachu del Medio, Pikachu del Norte, Sierra de las Truchas for the whole area, Laguna de Jose de Gil, right? Uh, all of those names that were in the first picture. Um, these were my results in 2014, uh, after my first semester of field work, and last semester in Going into this semester, I've been doing some more field work, and this is, these are my results now. Mm -hmm. um, the red dots are um, place names for which I have multiple attestations, so multiple consultants confirming that this is a name um, which differs from the one mapped, but is the one that is used um, in the community. <clears throat> uh, the black dots have just a single attestation. Uh, the question marks are ones that I'm dubious about either because I'm not sure about the location or other aspects of it. These ones are ones that I only have archival evidence for, but not oral um, transmission evidence. And the ones in this corner were um, shared to, with me with, by a um, um, scholar by the name of Roberto Valdez, uh, who's an MS in uh, geography and uh, worked a lot on place naming in the Rio Arriba. Um, so that's what I've been doing. All right, so that's the documentation. Right? Here's the typology of linguistic strategies. We've got five different ones. Right? Omission, which means there's no name on the map. Um, maintenance, which means there's a name in Spanish, but there's some issue with it. Um, partial translation, full translation, and new English names. Let's give some examples of that. So this is Rosa's work. Um, Rosa lives about there in the little hamlet of Cañoncito. At the top, uh, Las Colonias de Abajo, it's a partial translation of Lower Colonia. Um, La Morada de San Ignacio de Loyola is the Morada, not named. La Capilla de Santo Niño is a chapel in the town, not named. La Sierrita is another little hamlet, um, which also has a morada that's now disused, called La Morada de Nuestro Padre de Jesús Nazareno. And there's um, two caves, or alcove. Uh, La Cueva de los Gavilanes, the uh, cave of the Alpines, I want to say. And uh, La Cueva de los Indios, or de Don Juan Ruival, who's an ancestor of Rosa. Um, and so, of all those names, only these two are on the map. Um, then you've got deliberate omission of accent marks, which is sort of the first one where you've got a name that's maintained in Spanish, but there's something wrong with it. Um, Rio Valdez, Rio Mora, neither of them has an accent mark, and this is consistent. Right? There is not a single rio that has the accent mark on the I. There's not a single cañón that has the accent mark on the O. Um, misrepresentation of local dialect. This is a mountain, it's called El Valle de la Piedra. On the map it says El Valle de la Piedra. Right? So there's a metathesis uh, in how the local community produces this name, but it's not represented on the map. Um, errors by non manito field workers. Right, so we've got here, Rito, Cola, y Largo, um, and also the Cañón, Cola, y Largo, which is the Rito, Coli, Largos, and the Cañón, Coli, Largos. Uh, where Coli, Largos, it's um, unclear whether those are Ratones, Coli, Largos, or Leones, Coli, Largos. Um, 
So long-tailed mice or long-tailed lions. Um, but this was non-local people coming in, not knowing what this word meant, and then recording it wrong. Um, Oh, and then this is a full translation here, Bull Creek, El Rito del Toro. Okay. Um, in the partial translation, um, oof, that's so fast. <laughs> um, okay, so you, we've got here Pasada de Arriba, which is really, um, it, on the map it says Upper La Posada, so it's partial translation and error. Um, and new English names, this is El Bordo Lajado, which refers to these flagstones, um, but on the map it's called Trail Riders Wall, which refers to um, recreational activity. So to quantify that accuracy of like how much is actually represented, how much of what's on the map is Manito oral tradition, right? Um, I looked at um, U.S. Forest Service topo maps, 16 of them, and I um, coded all the features, all the named features for what kind of thing they were. Um, I, um, for this one, I am, I'm only showing you the figures for natural features and Mercedes, or land grants. I'm not doing settlements, I say yes, buildings, trails, and roads, and there's different reasons for those. If you want to know about that, I can talk about that in the Q&A. And there's about 457 names, um, with a couple repetitions, because this is sort of a quick and dirty version, I haven't had time to um, remove names that are duplicated because they're on various maps from this um, number set. So we've got um, accurate, a possible alternate, which I've got another alternate, but the one that's mapped sounds reasonable. And um, also po possible where um, there's some issues with it that I'm not positive that it's like, it's a name that's in Spanish, but I'm not positive it's accurate. Um, but those together total only 17.7%. And by accurate, I mean incorrect Spanish, like not misrepresenting local dialect, and you know, just all of those things. 11% um, of the names that are in there are names that I documented or that Roberto Valdez documented. Um, five, about 5% 5 are in error. Um, about 10% are translations, a quarter are half translations, which I think has to do sort of with um, exoticization of the Spanish place names and like keeping some of the Spanish in there, but not so much to say that this is fully legitimate, but sort of um, exoticizing it and using it for that. Then um, diacritics and dialect misrepresentation that put together, and that's about 12%, 12% that I can't code because for whatever reason uh, I don't have knowledge of the antecedents or whatever. Um, and about 8% that are fully new English names. So what I'm doing now is, uh, I started this, uh, I call it the Manito Topo uh, series project um, where I'm recording these traditional place names onto topographic maps. Um, the idea is to pr uh, provide an index glossary for each map um, and to make these freely available to uh, people in the community. Um, and there's, I've currently got 15 maps, maybe about five glosses finished. Um, here's sort of a small, like a corner of one of those maps, the same one again, right? So we've got Picacho del Norte, Picacho del Medio, Picacho del Sur, Sierra de las Truchas, Laguna de José Vigil. And then here, two branches of a river called the Rio Quemado. And if you zoom in on that, that's the Rio Quemado de este lado, and the Rio Quemado de aquel lado. <laughs> <laughs> um, and these were provided to me by a consultant from um, Truchas. And from Truchas, those dictic references are accurate. Now, if you go to Cundillo, if you go to Nambe, people in Cundillo and Nambe use this place, use this river. They go fishing there, right? 
they probably have different ways of differentiating those places. Uh, and then this is sort of a sample of a gloss that I do. So if you look at this one, you'll see that at the top it says C, D, E, F, G, and then in the back, one, two, three, four, five. That's so I can give an index. Where does this feature start? Where does it end if it's a linear feature? Or where is it located if it's a point feature? Um, and so I've got an English gloss, right, where I provide a translation, so the burnt river of this site. Uh, I give information about well, how it's represented um, on the government map. Um, yeah. uh, so the official name is anglicized, the dictic element is replaced with cardinal reference, diacritics are intentionally omitted, again, no rio, right? Mm -hmm. um, and the name likely alludes to Greco Mason, right? History, um, things that people tell me about this place. Um, any pregunta? <laughs> So we have like around nine minutes for questions. All the experts? That's um, the one in the back is in Pikachu del Sur. I'm, uh, if you have this one, that's right here. It's not a named place. <laughs> great, great presentation. What do you understand by Manito? By Manito, mm -hmm. um, Manito is a common sort of self-reference um, autonym that um, people in northern New Mexico use. So I would I would say the same thing that Bills and Vigil do. If you if you pass the abuelitos test, you're a Manito. <laughs> that is, if your both your grandparents, all your grandparents were born in uh, New Mexico, then you're a Manito. But does that exclude the native um, population? Right. So um, that uh, does exclude the native population. So the, the point of this is not, hey, this is the only people that are disenfranchised here. Right? Um, obviously, there's multiple groups of people that are disenfranchised by this um, government practice. However, um, there are reasons why the Pueblo specifically don't want their names on these maps. Right? Most of the Pueblo language, languages don't have a written form. Tiwa doesn't, Towa doesn't, which are two languages that have names for these places. Um, and when, uh, in the past, when indigenous groups have come to scholars um, to say, we, need, we want these places mapped, they want them mapped for private use, mm -hmm. right? They, they don't want this knowledge to be public. When you say uh, diacritics are intentionally omitted, is there a, what kind of a motive would, would, would be behind that? Is it just ignorance or is there some other kind of motive? Well, ignorance would, would be indicated if there's some names that have the accent mark and some names that don't, right? The, Consistent absence of the accent marks means that you know these people are aware that this is a spelling convention. They're just choosing to ignore it. Um, and why that is, you know, why is um, there's, she's not here, but Sara Pisani? Why isn't there a little upside down like circumflex on her name? Because that's a like that's a Polish name, Pecheni, right? It's just Americanization. But how often do you see, like, for the more frequent terms, like Espanol, uh, what do you, because uh, you've been around a lot more than me, I mean, uh, but right. you've seen a lot more signs, mm -hmm. uh, how often does the Enya appear, and how often does it? On street signs? Yeah, well, okay, or, so, or, you know, so this, the highway. This, right. This project was not about street signs. Street signs is another, like, really like prominent way that place names exist in public space. But, but right? like in the highway, you right. know, those green signs. Um, it's about 50-50. I've seen them change too. I, I, I used to write to um, Peña Blanca, and now I write to Peña Blanca when I go to Cochiti. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so there's some contestation of this, even within these communities. They're saying, you know, 
make the sign to our town say our town? Samia? Very nifty. So I think too, you know, uh, how does, you know, there, there's this deliberate cultural erasure. How does that go in hand with language maintenance? Well, how, how does this tie into right? So there's like, how does it go in hand with language maintenance, and how does it go in hand with access? Yeah. Right. Yeah. So, the way that place names get passed on orally is by use of these places, mm -hmm. right? And how, what, how were these places used? They were used for um, resource procurement, for um, pastoralism, for hunting, right? When the National Forest comes in, Santa Fe National Forest and Pecos Wilderness, all of those accesses are diminished and eventually erased, right? Um, last people that ran sheep in um, the Pecos was in the 1940s, perhaps the early 1950s. Right? I interviewed one of them. Um, so, you've got that, and then you've got children being beaten for speaking Spanish, right? And then, you know, even if they do talk about these places, not understanding what the names mean, mm -hmm. right? Um, and so that it, it all reinforces itself, right? Um, and there's changes on the landscape. I don't have the picture right here, but there's a place called El Sabanete del Comanche, which translates to the little savanna of the Comanche. And it used to be entirely connection, connected two and a half miles of meadow. Right? Now it's all cut up by forest. It's little vallecitos. Why is that? There's no sheep anymore. People don't do brush, burn, brush fires anymore. Right? These lands aren't maintained the way that they used to be. And so they change. Yeah, it's cool. I think you definitely, uh, as the work goes forward, uh, put in some uh, colonialist theory in here. You know, this is definitely looks like ongoing colonialism. This, you know, conquering mm -hmm. the mental universe. Absolutely, Con thing, you conquering know, the mental geography. The one, the, yeah, exactly. One cultural artifact at a time. The place name. You know, we don't value that. Goodbye. Your language. Speak English. You know. Uh, so. Oh, so, um, do I, can I? Okay. Um, so I think this goes really well with uh, Professor McKnight's talk yesterday. And so have you... You told me that at the end of the talk. <laughs> so, I said, you got to come to this, because this talks to what you were saying. So have you thought about how you would return this information to the communities involved? Right, that's actually one of the things that I wanted to ask you. The, the ideas that I've had is to get these, because these are digital files, right? Mm -hmm. uh, this map that I have is what I consider like a comparative map where it shows the government names and it shows the traditional names. Um, and to share those with local libraries, local schools. That's the first step that I can think of. Mm -hmm. um, but if there's any other ideas that you guys have, please have at it. Gorilla placement in, in parks go up and, and laminate. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> I love it. So, so oh, yeah. No, like um, Santa Fe ski area trail. Yeah. Mm -hmm. okay. Make a laminated map of the of this <laughs> and and like glue it on with super glue. So, <laughs> awesome visitor from Pecos. Where can we put this stuff? Where, can, where, where would we make it? Listen. Writing the Forest Service sign. That's right, put it. <laughs> but what about talking to the people in the Forest Service? Well, there there is um, there is um, a venue for requesting name changes. Right? So New Mexico has what's known as the New Mexico Geographic Names Institute, I believe, um, and they're basically the New Mexico branch of the BGN. Um, and they consider applications for um, name changes. However, they've historically been reticent to change names back to um, Hispano names. Um, <clears throat> if you remember Victoria, she, Victoria told me about a place, I think it was um, El Vallecito de la Piedra Rosa, algo así. Um, and they told her, but 
these, these, you know, the color of the rock can change. Oh. Something.